Good morning, everyone. Uh, the British School Talks are a program set up by myself, Josh, and Tom as part of um, a project by the Student Council. And uh, the British School Talks are part to present our first speaker, Mr. Matt Dickinson. and a writer who is best known for his award-winning novels and his documentary work for National Geographic, um, Discovery Channel, and the BBC. He was also one of the climbers who was caught in the 1996 Mount Everest disaster. His successful ascent of the north face of Mount Everest is his most challenging expedition to date, and saw him become the first British filmmaker to have filmed on the summit and returned alive. But please put your hands together for Mr. Matt Dickinson. Thank you very much. Now, the first thing I want to do is to forget about school. Is that right? Yeah. Yes? Good. Forget about it completely. Just let it squeeze out of your ears. And we are going to go on an incredible journey to the summit of the world's highest peak. And with a bit of luck, I'll bring you all back alive. Now, my journey began uh, with a book. It began in the library of my school, and I took it off the shelf when I was about 12 years old, when I first went to secondary school, a book which was about climbing, just by chance. And I was so inspired by that book, it excited me so much that it actually changed my life. In a way, I've actually spent the rest of my life trying to be the characters that I saw in that book. So it's been a fantastic journey, which I'm going to share with you here today. A journey of adventure, uh, a journey of risk, a journey which from time to time has pushed me to the absolute limit, I think it's fair to say, and a journey which has introduced me to some of the world's most incredible people. And I'm going to share some amazing adventures with you in the course of this brief presentation. Now, I do a lot of schools. I've done almost 300 schools around the world, mostly in the UK. Also, globally, I've been to Istanbul, I've been to Singapore, I've been to Hong Kong, and sometimes I ask the pupils a little question or two. Um, in Birmingham, in England recently, I asked the audience, I said, well, look, if you could take one person with you uh, on a journey to Mount Everest, who would you take? And this girl in the front row puts up her hand, and uh, she said, oh, yes, I'd, I'd take my friend. And I said, oh, that's really sweet take your friend, and she pointed to the girl that was sitting next to her. And I said, well, why would you take your friend? What is it about your friend that makes you so fond of her that that's the person that you'd want to take? And she said, well, if something went wrong and I was starving, I could eat her. <laughs> Which I thought was really, really funny. And actually, maybe it was horribly true. At another school uh, in Scotland, I asked the audience, if you could make one call from the summit of Mount Everest, um, who would you call? Quick as a flash, the boy put up his hand and said, Domino's Pizza. <laughs> so I'm hoping, I said, that is ridiculous. You never get a moped to the summit of Mount Everest. How are you going to get it up there in the first place? Um, so I'm hoping that you are just as responsive, just as witty, just as full of ideas as that, because I'm going to ask you a few questions as we go along as well. So I appreciate your response. I, I know it's a great big hall, massive great big hall, but don't be shy. Uh, participate in the discussion. But for now, I hope you can all see that tiny little figure standing at the foot of that incredible peak, a tiny human being, uh, facing an awesome, intimidating challenge. What I actually want you to do for the course of this presentation is to imagine that that is you. I actually want you to kind of put yourself in the climbing boots of that person and think, well, what would it feel like to go to Mount Everest or huge great big mountain for three months of your life, away from your family, away from your friends, away from all the food that you love, from your pets, from your favourite computer games, from your hobbies and your sports, a completely alien world. Um, put up your hands and tell me, how do you think you would feel emotionally to, to be in that situation? What would it make you feel like? And how would the mountain make you feel? What would be the emotions that the mountain would inspire? Yes? I would be very sad. So therefore, I would go into the shower and make all of my life's important decisions there. <laughs> okay. So, a type of sadness to be away from home, yes? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. 
You wouldn't have a shower on Everest. On Everest, you'd have three months without a shower. Guess how it is. Yeah, fear is a fundamental part of the process, and actually, it's important to be afraid, because if you're not afraid, you will be dangerous. Yes. Depressed. <laughs> well, depressed when things go wrong, yes, that is true. But when things go right, there's no more exhilarating sport than going to climb in the mountains of the world. Yes, how about you? Challenged and excited. Very, very good. And mixed up in all of that is a sense of um, privilege to be in that place. Yes, and the final one. You feel small and tiny. Very good. You feel small and tiny. You feel insignificant in the face of nature. And that is also very, very important. It's an important part of the process of climbing mountains. It's actually quite good for us to feel small from time to time. Now, my job has been to make films. I've made films for the National Geographic Channel, I've made films for Discovery, and I've made films for the BBC. And about 40 films over the years, and I've been doing that for about 20 years. Great fun, and if you wanted to be a filmmaker, my advice to you would be, what are you waiting for? Don't, don't hesitate, just get started. And that's my advice if you want to be a writer. In fact, anything creative, the most important thing is to actually do it. That's how you learn it. And so filmmaking is something that you can really learn by making little films. Put it onto YouTube, put it onto Vimeo, and then you have started your filmmaking career. At any age you can do that. And so how exciting is that to be able to create uh, incredible things and put it online so that people can see it. And the same is true of writing. Um, if you get into fan fiction, you get into blogging, uh, that, uh, short story competitions, there are so many opportunities that you can get involved with. If you want to be a creative person, create. Simple as that. Now, I have worked with some amazing people, and some of them have been really inspiring. Not just climbers who are like you know, really super professional athletes, but also amateur climbers as well. And uh, one of the oldest people I worked with in the mountains was actually an actor called Brian, who was 60 years old when we went to Mount Everest. But he is not the oldest person to climb Mount Everest. Recently, an 80-year-old Japanese man climbed to the summit of Mount Everest. 80. Can you imagine your great-grandparents or your grandparents climbing to the summit of Mount Everest? It's an incredible thought, isn't it? What an extraordinary person he must be. Um, do you know the age of the youngest person to climb Mount Everest? Does anybody here in the room know how, how young the youngest person? Yes. Eight. Eight? <laughs> Not quite an interesting guess, yeah. Fifteen? Thirteen. Thirteen is correct. Well done. Thirteen years old. A boy from America had summited Mount Everest at the age of thirteen. And last year, a girl from India did the same thing. Two 13-year-olds have reached the summit of Everest. I think that is incredible. But even more amazingly, recently, an 11-year-old boy put out a press release. You know what a press release is? Yeah, it's when you tell the press, you tell the journalists what you want to do, and they put it in the newspapers. Um, he put out a press release to say that he is going to climb to the summit of Mount Everest before his 12th birthday. So he's going to reach the summit while he's 11. Isn't that incredible? It's almost terrifying. I mean, I've got a daughter, I have five children. My youngest child is 12. She is 12, my daughter, Ariana. And I would never want her to see what I saw when I went to Mount Everest. It's a really hard place. There are actually, like, dead bodies near the top that you might actually see. Do you think that's right for an 11-year-old to have that experience? In fact, I'm actually quite interested to know your opinion. Uh, so in the front rows here, uh, let's have a few thoughts. Who thinks it's a good idea for an 11 year old to go to Mount Everest? Not a problem, and everything's fine with that. Yes. What, so, what, what's your feeling? What's your feeling about that? Okay. Anyone at any age should be able to climb Mount Everest. It's a very clear opinion. Thank you. Excellent. Yes, how about you? Yes. Okay. So, it's like mental, it's a mental game, yeah? Mental attitude, so maybe he's got the mental strength to do it, which would be amazing, yes? Yes, if he's been climbing from an early age, which actually he actually has. Um, who feels that it's not right for an 11-year-old to go to Mount Everest? Let's have a think and look for some opinions against the idea. Uh, yes, how about you? Yes, 
Yeah? But I do think it's kind of strange for someone to someone their age to be climbing down their and taking money and doing that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I said, oh, thank you so much. And my heart swelled with joy that this lovely, kind man would help me with my problem. He said, yeah, just, just put your fingers there on the edge of the table, Mr. Matt, and, and I'll sort you out. I said, right, thank you, great. Put my fingers there like that. And he reached down and he unzipped this great big bag and pulled out a saw with, 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 with jagged, two jagged teeth. Raise the sharp. I said, Mr. Matt, Mr. Matt, put your fingers there. I'll cut off the ends for you, and it'll save you $20 to see a doctor in Kathmandu. I said, $20? $20 is like 15 pounds. Are you crazy? Leave my fingers alone. I went to see the doctor. Thanks to his care of my own superhuman powers, I still have my fingers to this day, but those two fingers are effectively dead. I can't feel cold or heat or pain. You could slam them in a door, bang a six inch nail into the end. Uh, you may kindly offer to do that for me later, does it? Um, they are dead. I can't feel them. I can still wiggle them around. I can even type with them and do things, but actually, you know what? They're actually nerves have been destroyed by frostbite damage over the years. But at least I've still got my fingers, which is pretty handy. So I don't know it's a long way. Now, in addition to my filming, I also write books. I like to write for my children. Uh, my two youngest children, as I said, 15, that's my son Danny, and Ariana, who's 12. I love to write for them, and uh, it turns out that other young readers enjoy my books as well. So the Mortal Chaos series is a thriller series uh, based on chaos theory, and it's about disasters. So I've always been fascinated by, by the ways that disasters are caused. And then the other book series I've been working on is called The Everest Files. And we do have some copies of this here in the library for sale, and it's a thriller, a uh, very exciting adventure story about a 16-year-old boy who goes to Mount Everest and disappears without trace. He vanishes, and nobody knows what's happened, and his friends set out to try and solve the mystery. So it's about the dark side of Everest, how people can get so obsessed with reaching the summit that their actual behavior becomes really, really devious, and they may even end up lying and cheating in their desperation to reach the top. Going on to the subject of who are the people I work with? Well, they are men and women from all over the world. And not just mountain adventures, but also um, aviation challenges, diving films, whitewater rafting. And it's very important to, to make the point that adventure is as much for girls as it is for boys. And many of the explorers and climbers I've worked with have been female adventurers, and they are every bit as uh, challenging and courageous as, as the men. And this is one of those climbers. Her name is Chantal from France, climbing here with just a few sharpened millimetres of steel in the ice axes in her hands. On her feet, razor sharp crampon spikes. And she's climbing with hundreds of tons of crumbling ice above her head. Very, very, very risky place. If I tell you where she actually was doing this particular challenge, you will really think agree with me that she was pretty crazy. <clears throat> An iceberg rocking from side to side. We went up there to film her. It was tipping one way, tipping the other way. A very scary environment. And very unstable. And a lot of natural environments are very, very unstable. You have to be very cautious in the way that you approach them. Now, I'm quite interested to know what your thoughts are as to why a human being would want to take this type of risk. No one's paying her to do it. It's not something that actually, you know, it's, it's, it's not like a job. It's not something she has to do. It's something that she wants to do. Why do human beings want to take risks? Let's uh, see if we've got some thoughts on that, shall we? Uh, yes, how about you? The energy of it, yeah, that's a good answer. How about you, do you have one? Yeah, maybe they get famous in the future, that's true, they become well known and their reputation is, is enhanced, yes? Or the experience to test themselves, that's true, uh, to push the limits in a way that they haven't done before, yes? Midlife crisis. <laughs> I'm sure none of your teachers have got midlife crises, have you teachers? You don't want to go off and climb a, a mountain or uh, sail across an ocean, do you? Of course not. It's like those pushy parents that we haven't got. Teachers are all free from midlife crisis. Yes. Conquer your fears. Good answer. Absolutely true. Yes. 
Yeah, good point. So that you understand your own limits in a meaningful way, later find that you can do more and more things. Very good. Thank you. Now, <clears throat> we move on to a fascinating place. A place that actually puts a chill down my spine when I see this photograph. It's the highest mountain in the world, Mount Everest, and it is growing. Now, which geological genius in the room knows why Everest is growing? How can a mountain be growing? What's, what's the possible cause for it? Uh, yes, Harry. Yeah. Very good. Two tectonic plates have collided 70 million years ago. As they have pushed against each other, the plate that India is sitting on has uh, collided with the Eurasian plate, which is basically Tibet and the whole of uh, Eurasia, and it's actually caused a fold mountain range to be pushed up. So slowly, slowly, over 70 million years, it's been growing and growing and growing, and it's still growing to this day. And as I said, it's growing at the same speed as your fingernails are growing. So if you'd been born 70 million years ago and you'd never bothered to cut your fingernails, there would be 8,848 meters long, because that is how high Everest is. Just a small, little known, obscure, irrelevant fact. It's an amazing place, and it takes three months of your life to go and climb this mountain. $50,000 is the cost. But you'd have to start saving your pocket money soon. You think the banker, mummy and daddy could pay for, pay for a trip to a first? Yes? Yeah, I'm sure. They might think about it. I did Tangling School recently in Singapore. They are doing a school trip to Antarctica. A school what? trip to Antarctica. A school I went to, we were really lucky to go five miles down the road to Ivinghoe Beacon, which is a little tiny hill on the edge of the Chiltern Escarpment. Um, to go to Antarctica as a school trip, I think there are some very wealthy parents out there. But $50,000 is a lot of money by anybody's standards. Now, there may be people in the audience who are saying, you're saying that Everest is dangerous, how do we know it's true? Well, here you have the proof. This is for anybody that has a mathematical brain, a scientific brain. Okay? This shows us exactly how dangerous the highest mountains in the world actually are. What it turns out is that since 1953, when Everest was first climbed, for every 100 people who safely reached the top, four people didn't come home. So four percent chance of fatality to go to Mount Everest. Now, I obviously think that's acceptable because I have been to Everest, knowing that risk, I've been to the summit of Everest and uh, came back alive. So I got away with it. I was in the 96 percent that get to the summit safely and come back home. So my hands going up. Put up your hand if you think that, that is an acceptable level of risk. 4% chance of death for the pleasure of climbing the highest mountain in the world. Staff as well. Have we got any staff adrenaline junkies here? I wonder. <laughs> yes, a few. I can see a few hands going up. And actually, really quite a high percentage of pupils in the room are saying, yes, that is acceptable. Thank you, that's really interesting. It would be quite interesting to know what your parents would say if they could see you with your hand up there. Now, the next thing I'm going to tell you uh, is something that may alter your opinion about me. It may actually radically affect how you think about me and the person you actually think that I am. Because all you know so far is I'm a filmmaker, a writer, and I've got five children. Okay? But I'm about to tell you something which will actually radically affect the way that you think about me. The second highest mountain in the world is K2. It's in Pakistan. And on that mountain, for every 100 people who successfully reach the summit of that mountain, 29 people lose their lives. And the reason why I'm saying that you will, uh, I imagine, perhaps change your mind about me in a moment, is because if I was called up tomorrow by Discovery Channel or National Geographic or BBC, and they said, Matt, do you want to go and make a film on K2? I would say yes. I don't even know how I can say that, because it actually terrifies me that I even have that in my personality, but that is how much I would value the opportunity to go to that mountain. I would take that risk. And so my hand's going up. Is there anybody else in the room who would put up their hand and willingly take a 29% chance of fatality for the pleasure of climbing the second highest mountain in the world? Wow. Okay. Uh, I, I'm amazed. Amazed and surprised, and any staff, members of staff? No, this is one step too far, isn't it? Uh, sir, 29% chance? No. 
it's, it's a deal breaker, isn't it? Right. <laughs> How interesting. So I can feel a little school trip coming on, really. That's what we're looking at here, isn't it? This assessment forms will be filled out. Next stop, K2. Um, it's a fascinating business. Why do people want to take these risks? I, I really, in a way, I, I, I scarcely know myself, even though I want to take those risks myself. Um, when I think about why people have problems in the mountains, very often people cause the problems themselves. It's not the mountain which is the evil one. It's actually people being too ambitious, having a bad plan, having bad communications, getting it wrong, being just a bit crazy. Uh, those are the reasons why people have problems. That's very often the case. It's not the mountain that kills you, it's yourself. You kill yourself in the mountains. But when you go there, you feel a lot of tension. And this is the tension that our team felt in the very first day of our expedition. You can see the nervousness in the faces of my fellow climbers in our hotel in Canada. You start to make a journey through the incredible villages of the pool. And these are the areas that have been um, really decimated by the earthquake of last year. And I really hope that perhaps you got involved with some fundraising or some sort of uh, aid for the people of the pool. And if you did, um, I want you to think about doing more of that because they still need our help. The whole country is under pressure from the amount of devastation the earthquake caused. And villages like this have had a lot of damage. This is Namchi Bazaar, right in the heart of the Everest region. Who are the Sherpas? Well, they are fabulous people, very, very hardworking, sincere, genuine people who work with the expeditions. And some of them have been to the summit of Everest multiple times. Some of these men in this picture have been to the top of Everest more than 10 times in their life. How incredible is that? Yeah, it really is. Well, what a phenomenal achievement. They are superb mountaineers and very, very strong, hard people who've got great work ethic and they work extremely hard on the mountains. But look where they live. They live in little villages which are remote. There may be no clinic in a place like this, no school. So it's a very, very tough place to live in. And through the winter, you've got six months in which, uh, really, effectively, nothing can be grown. Very, very cold. So this is a hard, hard place. Finally, you reach base camp, and this is where you're going to spend three whole months of your life. And that is three months without a single bath or a shower. Like that idea? Three months without any fresh fruit or vegetables. Three months, and here is the bit which you may really, really struggle with. In fact, members of staff, if you've got a phone number, a local air ambulance, I want it hovering over the theatre just in case we have anyone who's going to, any of the people who's going to fall to the ground, their legs and arms weeping up an upturned cockroach. When I tell you, it is three months, and that is three months, by which I mean three whole months. Three months without a mobile phone. Could you survive? I wonder. That may be the hardest part of the whole challenge. That bit is your toilet. It's a hole in the ground. A hole in the ground can go to the loo three whole months of your life. You're living in a tent with your friend and you're going to eat inside that main tent there. And Everest is still about 20 kilometers away from where this photo is taken. So you've already got a very long journey just to get to the foot of the mountain. And that's why base camp is difficult. And already you feel the thin, thin air. Now, when you go to Everest, you have to go slow. And one of the reasons for that is because there's so little oxygen. There's just actually, at the highest levels on Everest, about 30% of the oxygen that we are breathing here, here in this room today. That's like 70% of your lungs have been removed. You can imagine a breath. <gasps> imagine 70% of your lungs are no longer available to you. That is what it feels like to take a breath on Everest. No kidding. And so your body needs to adapt, and you need to go slowly, and you are acclimatizing to the thin, thin air, and your body is changing. In fact, your blood is getting thicker. As soon as you go to altitude, your blood is getting thicker. Thicker and thicker and thicker. And so it's actually, it's actually like porridge. You know porridge? Yes? Do you like porridge? No? If you went to Mount Everest, you'd be certainly eating a lot of porridge, because it's a staple diet of mountaineers. We love our porridge. And that is fundamental. You've got to eat porridge, you've got to eat carbohydrates, you've got to eat pasta, you've got to eat rice. And also, 
uh, you've got to eat chocolate. So I'm going to tell you that if you went to Mount Everest, you'd have to eat 250 bars of chocolate in one expedition. That's five or six bars every day. But take my advice. Do not take toffee crisp. Do you know toffee crisp? Do you know it? Next time you go to England or a friend of yours goes to London, get them to bring you back a toffee crisp and you'll know my true Everest experience because I, I ate 250 bars of toffee crisp on Mount Everest. But take my advice, do not take this evil chocolate to Mount Everest because it's filled with Rice Krispies. And those Rice Krispies are loaded with oxygen that's in them. And so, as you rise the target altitude, every single one of those evil Rice Krispies starts to shimmer and shake as the pressure begins to build inside. Finally, bang, the whole thing explodes in your right side. And that's it, you chocolate shrapnel blowing in all directions. So do not take Toffee Crisp to Mount Everest. Take my word for it. It is a big mistake. <laughs> you build a series of camps. We had about six or seven camps along the way, and the Sherpa team helped us massively with this, helping to carry the tents, putting the tents up while we were doing the filming and concentrating on uh, uh, the, the film project. So we could not have done our project without the Sherpas, especially when the weather got bad. And on Everest, there is bad weather every couple of days. Every few days, there's a kind of a storm, and sometimes the storms are really big. And in that storm, the wind speed can be more than 100 miles an hour, hitting your flesh, blowing you off your feet. It's a very um, hostile environment indeed. And you just need to get to the safety of your five-star luxury accommodation. Now, I don't know what type of bedroom accommodation you've got, in fact, but I sincerely hope it's a little bit more luxurious than this. Would you say your rooms at home are, on balance, more luxurious than this, or less? What do you think? More? <laughs> less! <laughs> I don't, yeah, uh, somehow I can imagine that. This is a cold, nasty, dirty place, and it's really, really difficult to explain. But this is the hardest part of climbing Mount Everest. You know, the climbing part is actually easy compared to surviving this type of place. And it is really extreme to be in a tent like that for three months, in the wind, the wind whipping around, it is really, really extreme. Now recently, I hope you can all see on this picture, there's something that I want to tell you about. Because recently, I did an event in Scotland, and there was a boy in the audience who was just so excited by what I was telling him. His face was registering joy and happiness and, and, and just living every moment of the presentation. Finally, his hand went up, and his face went grey, and his hand was shaking like that. And he pointed up at the screen. He pointed up towards the right-hand side of the screen. He pointed up over here. His little hand was shaking. The poor little lad was, was terrified. He said, sir, sir, he said, is that the human brain? <laughs> I said, yes, it's a human brain, my friend. And his ears were blocked with wax. His nose was blocked with ice. The pressure was building as he went higher on the mountain. His cranial cavity was expanding horribly. At four o'clock in the morning, his brain popped out of his nose. They put it in the knee. And the boy looked at me and said, did you? I said, yes, he actually believed me. And then, do you know what I did? And this is very, very bad, because I have got a sick sense of humor. Um, I said, do you know what happened then? He said, what? I said, we were so hungry the next morning. I was going to put it in butter, put it in that little pan, uh, lit the little cooker, fried the brain on both sides till it was golden brown, sliced it up, put it on a green cracker, with a tiny little dog of, of, of ketchup, and his face went green. <laughs> his hand went up again, he said, what did it taste like? <laughs> I said, it tastes like chicken. I don't think it tastes like it. Oh. I think to this day he still believes that story. <laughs> I've ruined his life. Um, so, um, it's a tissue. It's a, it's a pink tissue. Right? It's not a human brain. Don't have a nightmare. <laughs> so, that's how you live. You're living in that place for day after day, week after week, in the most horrible, imaginable ways. 
People get tired. It gets exhausting to climb Mount Everest. The days go on forever. Day after day after day, it's cold. And a lot of people fail because they get homesick. They just miss their people at home, the people they love so much that they, they, they fail to climb the mountain because of that. And when you see the scale of it, the size of Everest, you realize what a massive challenge it is. But it's not too technical. Every single person in this room could climb Mount Everest, I promise you. It's not a technical mountain. You don't have to be incredibly talented as a mountaineer to climb this thing. You just have to have an enormous amount of determination. Yes, you do need to be fit. Yes, you do need to have a few techniques. But I could teach you the weekend to teach the techniques that you need to climb Mount Everest. It's not rocket science. It's actually relatively simple. And most of it looks like this. It's like you know, a great big hill of horrible, crumbling rock. But it really is a very big hill. And it takes a very long time to get up it. And because of the thin air, there are these problems you have to solve. Sometimes it's steep. There are places where it's vertical. And then you have to rely on ladders, which can be flopping around the face, all sorts of um, hazards. Rockfall can come down. So there are objective dangers, and also avalanches as well. And if there's an earthquake while you're in Everest, and you've really got a problem, like last year, when 16 people tragically lost their lives because of the earthquake that um, uh, hit Nepal in uh, May of last year. Finally, you reach this place, the highest place on the planet where you can actually pitch a tent. And this is where we spent a few hours before our summit attempt. And for me, as an individual, having loved mountains and climbing ever since I was your age, what a thrill to be in a situation where I knew that we were about to have a summit attempt. It was a great honor for me, a privilege for me, uh, to be able to be in that situation, though, by reaching the top, just to have a summit attempt. It was like a dream come true, a dream of my whole life, to be in that situation. There's a lot of junk. You see these incredible views, but at the same time, there's rubbish. People have just left oxygen cylinders around. There's all sorts of junk and rubbish which is hanging about. And that is a great, great shame, isn't it? That so many uh, people are disrespectful of the environment in this pristine place. Um, sometimes you find climbers in trouble. Uh, we actually helped a climber who was exhausted and uh, uh, gave him tea, gave him chocolate and water and uh, helped him to get back down. Um, there are many people who get into trouble up there. At a certain level, it's called the death zone. And it's called the death zone because human life does not belong. So it's a very extreme place. So if you ever go, you have to make a very good plan. And you have to have people around you which really care for you and are really going to help you to reach the top in a good way, safely, and to reach the summit and to understand that the summit is the halfway point. When you are standing on the summit of Mount Everest, you're halfway there. Okay? It's a really difficult thing to get your mind around, isn't it? When you're on the top, you feel like it's over. You feel like that's the end of the challenge. It's not true. When you are on the summit of Mount Everest, it's actually the halfway point of your expedition. And that is an amazing thing. Here's the final summit ridge. Amazing moment. Uh, incredible for us to, to look up and see, wow, we've nearly made it, which is 40 minutes from the top. I'm going to show you the footage that I shot that day of my friend coming up towards the top. There's a little interview with, uh, with my friend Sunday at base camp first, and then you're going to see what it's like for a human being to reach the actual summit of Mount Everest. So let's watch this video now, and you're going to experience what it's actually like to take a few final steps to the summit of Mount Everest in the footage that I filmed with my own little camera uh, on the top of the mountain that day. So here we go. Um, but I suppose our, our Serdar was, he was just very calm and he just sort of said God's very powerful. One day he kills people, other days he lets people to the top. 10.30 in the morning, Matt and the three Sherpas have made it. Alan Hinks fights his way up the final summit pyramid at 29,000 feet.
human being achieves their lifelong ambition to reach the summit of Mount Everest. And for me, it means a, a real lump to my throat to see those pictures because I know what it took to, for him to get to that place and to be in that place. And uh, it's such a special moment for, for me to be able to show you those pictures here today. Now, uh, when I look at that whole experience, I really think it was, uh, it was definitely extreme. It was definitely an experience that took me to the limit. And uh, it was an experience which, from which I think I learned a lot. Um, you know, you, you don't go through those things and experience things like that without learning about yourself. You learn about your own limits. You learn about what you can do and what you can't do. You learn about how hard you can push. And on one occasion, I got so close to giving up. I got so close to giving up. I still to this day hardly know how it's possible that I kept going because I was, I was just finished physically and mentally, I was on the absolute limit of what I could achieve. So um, I'm very proud of myself that I've punched through that pain barrier. And really, achieving something like Everest is, is about getting through the pain barriers. It's about being resilient, it's about being determined, it's about having absolute determination to keep going uh, no matter what happens. And I hope that in the course of this presentation, you will also just perhaps got a little thought What's your Everest, you know? Um, have you got an Everest of your own? In the future, it will be something that you can look towards on the horizon and think that that is something that you would love to do. Because it's great for us to have that inspir inspiring thought uh, of an achievement, of a dream, of something that in the future uh, could be your personal Everest that you will uh, head towards and hold, cherish uh, uh, to your heart as something that you want to do. So I wonder if we've got a couple of questions, maybe. I think we've got a, we've got a couple of minutes left. Yeah, maybe a couple of questions from the audience would be, would be good. And let's go to the next time. Why did I want to climb it? Well, it, it was, in a very real sense, a job. I was actually um, employed to go there and do that film. So it was a filmmaking project, and that was the real reason. But the deeper reason was that I, I've always wanted to climb a mountain on a personal basis. So it's a personal project as well. Uh, yes, uh, Yes, sometimes the ice can clog up the mask, and that's really dangerous because then you have a situation where you can't breathe at all, and that gets really nasty. So it definitely um, can be a situation where um, if you get your part, mask gets iced up, then that is a real problem. Uh, yes, Marie. Did anybody, did anybody Nobody in our team uh, died. Uh, in fact, nobody even got an injury in our team, which is really lucky. And that's a reflection of how careful, carefully we, we, we approach the safety. You know, we're really, really careful about safety, and we really think about it properly, and we, we make a plan. If you've got a good plan, then anything is possible. Okay? You have to be cautious in the mountains and really take care. Uh, let's see over here. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yes, how about you? Have you climbed any other mountains? Uh, recently, I climbed Mount Aconcagua which is in uh, Argentina, which is the highest mountain in the world outside of the Himalayas. And I'm planning to go back to the Everest region in about six weeks um, to go to um, Everest Base Camp again to do some interviews with people there and work on a new project. And, okay, I can see a couple of hands at the back. I'm going to try and take a couple of questions because we've favoured uh, university the people at the front. So it's only fair to go up the back a little bit. And hello to my friends up here. Uh, what was your question, please, sir? What's it like if you take your mask off? It, you can hardly breathe. You know, it's actually so little oxygen that it's really, really difficult to actually breathe at all. But some people have actually climbed Mount Everest without supplementary oxygen. How they do that, I just don't know. Yes? Scary of going down. Scary, it's so scary going down because you're so tired. And so you can easily make a mistake on the way down. Definitely a problem. It's much, much easier to go up. Yes, how about you? Uh, yeah, same question again. Climbing down, I would say, is actually much, much more um, difficult because you're exhausted, you're really tired, at that point where you want to collapse. So that's definitely true. And how about you? 
uh, to the summit once. Been to the summit once, but I've been to the Everest region doing filming uh, about five. The course of my filming career, yes. Uh, do my children want to climb Mount Everest? Well, one of my children, Greg, has actually climbed Kilimanjaro. It's a good start, the highest mountain in Africa. So, yeah, I think maybe in the future, one of my children might do. Who knows, my daughter might do. She seems to be quite keen on climbing. Yes. Do your fingers fall off? <laughs> yeah, your fingers can fall off with frostbite. That's definitely a, uh, a problem, you know, if you saw, saw the um, way that my fingers were after that filming expedition. So, yes, if you do get frostbite, that can be uh, very bad news for your fingers, uh, indeed. <laughs> That's definitely true. So I think we are pretty much, am I right think we're at the end of the session? I just want to say, um, thank you. You're an um, not just in your achievements, but how much you give back on the lecture tours and the documentary making and the wonderful books that you've written. So all that remains now is to say a big, massive BSPL thank you.